one, two, three. Good afternoon. Welcome to Google Docs Fabulous Features, a webinar from Spark PD Department. Hi, my name is Anthony Luskery, and I'm a technology integrationist at Spark, the Stark Portage Area Computer Consortium. This session um, is designed for anyone, anywhere. Along with my partner, Eric Kurtz, we serve approximately 30 school districts in our area, but we invite anyone to view this webinar. Whether you're watching this live or recorded, we welcome participants around Northeast Ohio, around the U.S., and throughout the world. For today's webinar, you can find all the resources you will need at tiny.cc slash spark s p a r c c 232 again tiny.cc s p a r c c 232 when you go to that link you will see a page that looks similar to this you will see the recorded uh, copy of the webinar you will see session resources uh, we are not having a live chat document today so there is no link to that also, there's a session evaluation section that'll be um, that link will be available after the conference, and we'd really like your feedback on the sessions. After you've watched the session, you can take the session quiz, and by passing the ses session quiz, you will see receive via email a PDF for one hour of contact professional development from the Stark County ESC, and then you can use that um, for your continuing education. There will be a slight delay in the quiz being posted today, so please be patient. The quiz will probably be posted approximately one half hour following the session today. For today's session, you're also welcome to open a Google document on your own account and follow along and try the features firsthand as we go through them. Eric and myself got together and we sort of tried to figure out what are some of the top fabulous features of Google Docs. Now, many people still see Google Docs as that tool that it was about 14 years ago that was very similar to Notepad, but you had the ability to share and collaborate. Everything else was very rudimentary, didn't have a lot of fonts, didn't have a lot of features, but that's really changed a lot over the last few years. And even some of the features I'm gonna to show today are only a few months old. So we're gonna go through a number of features, but I just made a top 10 list here. The first item is obviously sharing and collaboration. This webinar, though, will not discuss that directly. So we have another webinar at tiny.cc slash spark204 that you can watch, and that will go into great depth in explaining collaboration and sharing using Google Docs. So we'll be going through the other nine, and if we have time, we'll also be giving a few bonus features at the end. So you're welcome to follow along. What we're going to do is we're going to move from left to right in the menu of Google Docs. So we'll start the file, the file end of things and move towards the right, towards the help section. I'm going to jump back and forth between the presentation and a live Google Doc so I can demonstrate some of these items. So please be patient as we jump back and forth. The first thing, of course, is sharing. And here's the link again. If you'd like to share the, find out more about sharing, please watch the webinar. The next thing is our second fabulous feature, and it's a great feature. It is the file revision history. It gives you the ability to restore any previous version of the document. So let's go over to document and take a look at it. This is a document I've been working with today. I did another presentation earlier today. And right now it looks pretty blank, but let's go over to file, down the menu to see revision history. On the right, a small box will pop up on the right hand side of our screen. Now the first thing I want you to do is get in the habit of always going down to the bottom where it says show more detailed revisions. That'll show you the full uh, series of snapshots or revisions that you have available to you from this document. So let's take a look. Let's go back to the very first one here and you'll see that the document was blank. Not a surprise. And you notice that my name is on each of these. If there was more than one person involved, their name would be listed, and they would also have a color code. So I might have a color code here, 
and they would have a color code. So let's just jump in a couple spots here and take a look and see how this document progressed. You notice here that uh, the fabulous features title was already there, and I had some other things added, and I deleted them. The fact that I deleted them shows up as being uh, strike th with a strike through character. So if we look at a different point in time, we see that we had a character that was added. It looks like a starburst there. And if we go for a little bit further ahead, you will see additional changes throughout the document. And a pair of raccoons appeared. And some writing appeared. So you can see that we can go through the revision history. And I can choose to pick any point in the revision history, click on the restore this revision, and it will jump back to that version of the document. Now, it's not a one-time only. You get to do it as many times as you'd like. All the revision history will remain intact no matter whether you restore or not. So let's go back and let's restore this document to a little more freak, a little more recent time. And we'll go ahead and restore it to this plain blank document I'll be working with now. Again, a couple things you can use the revision history for besides uh, finding things that have been lost or uh, things that have accidentally been deleted. You can use this to monitor student progress by looking at their revision history. You'll see when they started the project, what they did at each time they worked on the project. And if you happen to look at it, it says 1047 and there's one page and at 1048 there's five pages. I think you can guess that the student didn't type very fast. There was probably a copy and paste that took place. Also, if it's a group project, you can see who contributed what to the entire document. So we're gonna jump and restore to this version of our document. So that's our first fabulous feature and you know what? It's probably worth the entire price of admission when you lose something in a document. The next item is not quite as fabulous but it is a great feature also and that's the ability to publish something to the web. And this is available in all of the Google tools, Google Docs, Google Slides, Google Sheets, Google Forms all have the ability to publish on the web. And you'll notice right now I am showing a Google Sheet, uh, sorry, a Google Slide presentation, and you're not seeing any menus around it because it has been published to the web. Same thing is true of a document. And if we go to File, you can see that we can get on to Publish to the web. And basically that does a couple things. It takes the menu off around the edges of it. It lets you easily embed it in a web page and have it look nice. And you don't have the distraction of the menus. Our next item is file download as, and Google Docs supports a wide variety of downloads. You can download to any of these file types. Um, so if you have someone that would like a Microsoft Word version of your document, you can simply click on the file, download as, and choose the type of document you want to download it as. So a great way to share documents with people who do not have Google Docs. The reverse works also. If someone shares a document with you in any of these following formats, you can directly open it. Now, when I say directly, that means it's very simple to open it. It'll open up directly. Pretty much everything will be there. Few exceptions. We'll talk about those later. But you can upload a document and open it up if it's in any of these formats. You can also upload documents of any type to your drive. Uh, whether you want to store something there. If you have a Google Apps for Education account, you have unlimited storage. So please feel free to store things there. I used to carry three USB drives in my pocket, and now I don't carry any. They pushed everything up to the cloud in my Google Drive. We'll talk about how you can also use some other file types besides these word processing file types a little later. And I guess we're there. Our next fabulous feature is the ability to convert things to a Google Doc. Now the first one, going from a Word Doc to a um, Google Doc is not very exciting. And going from an open um, Office Doc to a Google Doc is not very exciting. The one that's the fabulous feature that I want to talk about is going from PDF, which you cannot, of course, edit, to a Google document, which you can edit. So let's take a quick look at that. I'm going to go to my drive, and you have to pardon my drive. It's a mess. I have many, many files there. So we're going to go into the recent section of my uh, drive, and we're going to take a look at a PDF. I'm going to double-click on this PDF. It'll open up in what is called the view mode. And the view mode, you can tell because it has this black area around it. You can do things like print, download, but you can't do much else with it. You, of course, cannot click on the document. You can't 
really change anything from here. So we're going to go ahead and close that, and we're going to go back to our original drive. This time, I'm going to scroll it up here a little bit so you can see it a little better. Instead of double-clicking it, I'm going to right-click on it. And when I right-click on it, it gives me a menu. The item we want to use for this is Open With. And you notice when Open With pops up, it gives us a variety of choices. We want to choose the item that says Google Docs. And what actually happens is it'll take that PDF and it will run OCR, Optical Character Recognition, on that document, that PDF, and it converts it into a editable Google document. And just to prove that to you, I'll come in here, we'll put some spaces and put some characters in here. Now, some of the things that may or may not come, come across when you do this feature. Well, before we go there, let's just talk real quickly. It supports PDFs. It supports PNGs, which are image files. It also supports images that you can scan. Uh, you can also use screen captures. And you can also use handwritten or printed documents, printed being the keyword. Cursive doesn't work very well. If you can scan that in or get that into your computer, you can run OCR on those also. Now, I mentioned earlier that there's a few limitations. The first limitations are in OCR accuracy. And those are affected by things such as fonts that are too small or very unusual fonts. So if you choose to use that uh, snow cap font with a little piles of snow on top of each letter, it's probably not going to work as well as if you have Arial or Times Roman. But it does work with most fonts, but very unusual fonts, sometimes difficult. And again, if the fonts are too small, sometimes hard. If you have a scan document and it is of poor quality, it's it's turned sideways, it's, it's ripped, it's torn, it's got a coffee stain on it, it might have a little bit of trouble. And also, the color of the page and or the font that you're working with can influence it. So if you have a, a you know, a light blue font on a sort of gray background, it gets kind of hard for OCR to work. So those are some of the limitations based on the document you're working with. The other set of limitations that we need to talk about are the fact that it loses a couple features. Our PDF looked great. It had images in it. It had bullets. It might have a numbered list. It could have frames, borders. It could have hyperlinks in it. All of these will be pretty much lost during the OCR process. Now, bullets and numbered lists actually come across fairly well, but you will not get images. You will not get frames. And you will get the text of the hyperlink, but the actual hyperlink behind it will be lost because it cannot bring that in. You can always add it very easily. Now, the nice thing is you can simply go through your document run a quick spell check and find errors that might have occurred. Some of the things that you might find is sometimes I'll find an L followed by an N will look like an H. It just lost the space in between. So a quick spell check will help get you on your way to getting a document that looks the way you want and you can reformat it. But the great thing is you're able to take a document you're not able to edit and create an editable form from that document. It's especially great for screenshots. If you ever see an error message on your screen, you can't copy and paste it. You can do a screenshot, bring it into OCR, run run the, um, the image to Google Doc, let it run the OCR, and have that so you can print it, paste it into an email, edit it, whatever you'd like to do. Now, I want to stop here because some people ask, well, what, cannot, what, Google, what can Google Docs not do that you could do with Microsoft Word? Well, there's about nine or 10 things I'm gonna mention here. And you may find some of them important. You may find none of them important. Uh, the first one is columns. And actually, when I say columns, it's usually something that you probably don't wanna use anyway. If you're using columns to lay out text in a tabular format, you actually wanna be using a table. And if you don't want the table lines, you can always turn those off by going to table properties. So columns are really only if you're writing newspaper articles. Uh, text to tab, tables is a feature that's not there. It's sort of fun. The one I miss the most is probably one that many people don't even think about. And that's the ability to show or hide the formatting characters, such as the paragraph marker, the tab, so the invisible characters show up. Um, many people say you can't do a mail merge, but you actually can. It just requires an additional step you have to create a spreadsheet with an add-on, and that add-on will allow you to do a mail merge. So it actually requires two documents, a spreadsheet and an accompanying Google Doc to do your mail merge. But actually, when you're doing a mail merge on Microsoft Word, you have to have the data somewhere also, 
again often in a spreadsheet. So not that much difference there. One of the big things that you cannot do is you don't get the ability to use text effects, word art, drop caps, watermarks, those type of things are not supported. Now, Eric just did a little uh, post on his uh, blog, Control Alt Achieve. And on there, he talks about how you can mimic this by using Google Drawings or Google Slides to create these rich effects and then paste them in as images on your Google Docs. So you still can do them just in a little different format. Uh, image wrapping is slightly different. It, you basically get a square in Google Docs. In Word, you can do round, round wrapping and triangles and other things. Uh, embedded charts, probably not a lot of people do that and page frames or multiple image borders all around the document. Again, you can do it, but you'd have to do it in one of the other tools such as drawings or slides and then bring it in. So really not a lot of things that you can't do with Google Docs. And of course, with Microsoft Office, you, Microsoft uh, Word, you cannot do many of the fabulous features we're doing today. So let's continue down our tour and we're still at the file menu. And one of the things you can do from the file menu is you can go into the file menu, menu and go to new. And instead of choosing a document, you can go down to where it says template. And that'll open the template gallery. From there, you can pick pre-designed templates for you to use. Here's a resume, some letters, etc. You can also save your own templates and share them with other people in your domain. So templates are something that's sort of fun. Not one of the fabulous features, but a great feature. We're next. We're coming up on our next fabulous feature, and for that, we need to move to the next menu option. So we're going to go back in our document, and we're going to move from the file section to the edit section. I'm going to highlight a word here, fabulous, and I'm going to right-click on it and copy it. And you'll notice that if I come down here, I can paste it. Right-click, paste. You can do it again. Paste. But now I need features, and if I copy features, when I go to paste, I can paste in features, but I can't paste fabulous because it's overwritten on the clipboard. Well, Google Docs has something called a web clipboard, and the way it works is if I highlight a word, and then I go to edit, and then go to the web clipboard, I can copy that word to the clipboard, and it will be available to me. So you notice some words I've copied earlier today, these are all available to me. So I would have my name because I'm going to use it to paste a lot of time. So this way it keeps a clipboard full of items that you might want to paste into a document. So while you're working on a research paper or something where you're using the same term over and over again, it's convenient because you have them all in your web clipboard. It isn't overwritten by the next item. You can clear it out when you want to but you can continue to add items. I'm not sure how many it'll support. I know once you get over 20, it'd be kind of hard to get it on the page, so I'm not sure if there is a limit or not. So that's the web clipboard. Our next item is very simple, and that's under the view section of the menu. And that's simply the fact that I own this document, so I have editing capability on this document. But if I want to demonstrate the other, three mo the other two modes, viewing mode, or commenting mode, I can simply click on this and I can change modes to any of the three modes by going into editing, suggesting, or viewing. I can also do this in the upper right hand corner where it says editing on my menu bar. I can change from the pencil to the suggesting or to the viewing. So it's just a quick way to alternate between the modes so you can do the different modes without having to change ownership of a document or change the, the privileges on a document. So that that's, finishes up view for us. The next section is insert. And we have a number of fabulous features under insert. And the first one we're gonna talk about is inserting a comment. So I will actually take advantage of the thing we just did a few moments ago, and I will go into the commenting or suggesting mode. When I click on that, I can highlight a section of my document, go up to insert, and I can insert a comment. A little box will appear on the right, and I can type in here, um, is this spelled correctly?
And when I create a comment, when the student comes in, they will see the highlighted section. When they click on the highlighted section, it will pop up the comment so I can have multiple comments available here. They can either reply to me or they can click that they've resolved it by fixing the problem. When they click resolve, it doesn't go away permanently. It goes up into the commenting section up at the top here, and you can always go back and view the entire commenting sequence on the document. Now, language arts was probably my worst subject in school, especially writing. And I did enough. I did, it wasn't really bad, but I wasn't a great writer. I was a great reader, but not a great writer. And part of the problem was I would get a grade as opposed to getting corrected and having to fix it. I wrote for a magazine for three years, and having an editor versus a grader makes a huge difference in improving your writing capability. And I firmly think that being able to put in comments for your students to correct their document during the whole writing process is an invaluable tool. And a matter of fact, we have a whole webinar on that process, on improving the writing process with Google Docs and some of the tools, and commenting is definitely one of them. So let's go ahead and close this document because we're done with it. And we'll continue back through. Uh, there is another way to do it. You can uh, to you can insert a document as I said, a suggestion as I did. I'm sorry, insert a comment as I did earlier, or you can type in a suggested comment. Now I find this works pretty well for adults. I find this somewhat confusing for students. I'm going to switch modes here over to the suggesting mode, and you'll notice when I type in something, you'll see a box of color around it. And I'm going to type in, this is a suggestion. Now, the student has the ability later on to pick the checkbox to accept the suggestion, or they can hit the X to reject the selection. If they do that, the selection goes away because it's not really part of the document. It is simply a suggested edit for the document. I, I find that works much better with older students. I think the inserting comment works much better with younger students. It's easier to keep track of. But it does work great if you're doing some brainstorming with your gr group of teachers or someone. It makes it very easy for you to type in suggestions, and then they can be accepted. And again, they are all color-coded by whoever is logged into your document. I only have one person in my document right now, so it's not very exciting because it's all one color. So again, you can insert a comment, or you can insert a suggestion. Now we come to one of my absolute favorite fabulous features, and that's insert special, insert special characters. Well, why would you want a special character? Well, if you teach a foreign language, you need uh, some different letters. Maybe you're teaching German and you need an O with an umlaut above it. Or maybe you're teaching math and you want to put in the square root sign. Or maybe you're doing science and you want to put in the mega sign to show resistance. So all of these things are really neat, and there is a way to do them in almost any program, and that's where you hold down the alternate key, and on your number pad, type in the three-digit hex code. Now, you got to remember that, and you got to look it up, so you'll find yourself looking it up. But the neat thing about Google Docs is there's actually five ways to insert a special character. So let's go take a look at that. We're going to delete a couple things here because we got a little out of control. I'm going to go up to Insert Special Characters. And you'll see that it opens up a dialog box, and I have a variety of ways I can do it. The first way is I can come over here to this little dropdown on symbols, and I can find different types of symbols. So if I want a mathematical symbols, I could go in here, just choose that, and it'll give me math symbols. So I can choose from any of these different categories of doing it that way. I can also go to the little search bar, and I can type in something like left arrow. And it will look for left arrows. And here's a left arrow. We can go ahead and click it and insert it directly into our document. Let's insert a couple of them. And let's insert maybe this other one also. So you notice we were able to do those by searching based on a category or a name. Now, those are sort of fun, but actually the most fun is yet to come. Sort of like the, that thing that slices, dices, and minces. And it does more. And the thing that it does is it lets you draw what symbol you want to insert. And it will guess based on that, oh, you want an omega. So you can insert an omega. Let's say we did this little thing. We couldn't remember how to put a pi in there. So we sort of draw a pi. And there we go. There's the letter pi. And we can insert it. And we can have a couple different varieties. I'm going to do this version here. So you notice we have a variety of things that match that type of diagram. 
Let's go back to our foreign languages and let's draw an O. And let's put a couple little dots on top of it. And you'll see that we have our umlauted O here. And we'll go ahead and insert a couple of those. So there's a wide variety of ways to insert special characters in a document. Definitely a fabulous feature for anyone that needs to have special characters in their document without having to remember the ASCII code to type it in. We'll go ahead and delete these special characters and we'll continue down our tour. On the uh, webinar resources, this presentation is available. You may have noticed it. So you can walk through this or you can use this with your class or maybe you might want to do a professional development with other teachers. So in here I have a diagram screenshot of the variety of different ways you can insert special characters. Our next feature is inserting images. Now, it, it doesn't just give you one way to insert an image. We actually have seven different ways to insert images in our document. And let's go take a look at our document and see what some of those choices are. When I click on insert image, I can choose something from my hard drive and import it that way. I can click on insert image and I can choose a, a web address. I could go to my picture albums. I could go to Google Drive or I could do a search. Let's search for raccoons. And there's some raccoons and I can simply click on this raccoon, select it and insert that picture into my document will resize it because it's a very large raccoon. It looks like it's very frightened or ready to attack. So we'll move down. Another way to insert an image is to take a photograph. Now I'm going to be daring and try and do this here. So let's see how well it works. My laptop is on the other side from me. So let's see if this works okay. There I am. I'm going to just show you my hand. We're going to insert a picture of my hand by taking a snapshot. We'll select it. And you notice you can take a couple snapshots until you get one that looks good. And that is an extremely scary picture. So I'm gonna resize it, make it a lot smaller and change it. So there's a wide variety of ways to insert images. In addition, I'm gonna sort of jump ahead here because I have an image available. We can click on an image and resize it just like any other program. We can turn it by grabbing the top handles. We can stretch it out and we can do all those sort of things that you normally do. But one neat thing is if you click on it once and then click on it again or you double click on it, it brings up these little black areas on the corners and on the sides. And what they do is they allow you to actually crop the document. So we're gonna crop it down so it's just part of my hand here. We're gonna double click on it and hit enter. And you notice now I've cropped it. Not only I've resized it, I've actually cut portions of it off. I also have the ability to do image editing where I can change the transparency and the, and the hue and the colors. Uh, we're not gonna go through that feature right now, but that's an additional feature that you can do in Google Docs and in Google Slides. Our next fabulous feature, we're going to move over to our next menu item and we're going to talk about formatting fonts. Now, I know some of you have hundreds of fonts on your computer and maybe the first time you looked at Google Docs, you were disappointed by the fact that there was about eight. And then they added maybe another 12 so you could get up to 20 and it was sort of disappointing because you didn't have all the types of fonts you wanted. One of the nice things that's happened is recently, Google has added something called web fonts. And web fonts work this way. I can go to my fonts, and you notice I have a lot of them. If I want more fonts, I simply click on the more fonts button, and I can search for a font. I can find fonts that are different types of fonts. Let's find handwriting fonts, and it'll find me some handwriting fonts. I can choose to add these fonts to my battery of fonts, which you see on the right here, and I can then use that font in the future. So if I want to use Architects, I can simply come in here and use that font. I just installed Architects Daughter, and you notice it gives me a handwritten feature there. Now, a couple other neat things about the, the web fonts. There's a lot of them, which is great. You can search for them, which is great. 
But probably the best thing is the other person doesn't need to have the font installed on their computer. For example, if you're working with Microsoft Word and you choose something like a, a really special font, uh, you can highlight, highlight it, change the font in your document, and then share that document with someone. When you send a copy of it to them or you make a copy for them, and they open it. Let's say you send it via email as an attachment. When they open it on their site, if they do not have that font installed on their computer, it will substitute a plain, ordinary font. So my fabulous features might turn back into Arial or Times Roman, and they won't have any idea of the artistic flair that I wanted to add to my document. So web fonts are free, numerous, easy to find, and they work on every computer without having to worry about whether something is installed or not. So they're pretty neat. So web fonts are definitely one of our fabulous features. Now I have a really boring feature, but something you might need to use sometimes. If you've gotten a little crazy with your fonts, or maybe you've copied and pasted something from a website and this giant purple characters, maybe 72 point font bold, and you want to just return them into something simple like Arial, you can highlight them all or highlight your entire document. And on our document menu, over to the right, there's something that looks like a little T with a little X under it. When we click on that, that clears all of our formatting. So you notice it brought it back, it isn't centered anymore. It isn't in Fabulous Daughter anymore, and it's moved the size back to my default size of 11. So when I do that, it clears all, everything and returns it to my default style. Now I'm going to hit my re undo button because I like that way it looked. But again, that's the clear anything that you might have. Okay, probably ready for, again, one of the top, top fabulous tools, and that's the research tool. This tool alone is worth watching this webinar for. So let's take a look at what it can do. So my assignment today is to write an article about raccoons. So I could go out and go to the web and I could search. I could open a book and search. I could do a Google search. I could do a lot of different things to try and find information on raccoons. And I could type it all in there and I can use a either some tools or I can go through myself and put citations in. But Google Docs thought it might be easier if a lot of those things were available immediately. So let's go to tools and let's go down to research and open the research tool. It opens in the right in a box and the research tool has a search spot in it. In the middle between the G and the search, there's a tiny little drop down and that lets you narrow your search. So if you want to go from everything to just images or just scholarly articles or quotes or dictionaries, you can do that by using this little tiny drop down arrow between the G and the search. We're going to go for everything and we're going to type in the word raccoons. We're just going to type in raccoon. And you notice that I found some raccoons here. There's some pictures, there's some data, there's some articles. I'm going to go through some of these pictures here. Oh, I like these raccoons. I'm going to take these raccoons and just drag them over and drop. And notice that's another way to insert an image. Now, you might notice right here at the bottom, and I just drug it to the wrong side. I'll make it a little larger so you can see it. We have a character there of one. And the digit one... I'm going to zoom in just a little bit more here. The digit one isn't just because it's the first image. It is actually, in fact, a footnote giving me a citation of or a location of that document. So it shows me where that image came from in this case. So it gives me a link back to the original image, the website, and the name of the image. Pretty neat. So now I need to continue writing my report here, and I'm going to go through some data on raccoons, uh, raccoons stealing dog food, Racco raccoons international. I think I want to put in this thing about the internet, the, the raccoons stealing cat food. Now I could click on this title and go out and read this whole article. And that's what I should do if I'm a student, but I'm just going to demonstrate this to you today. I'm going to grab this piece of text and I'm just going to drag it over here and drop it. We're going to make it on the next line, make it a little larger. And there's my raccoon stealing food. 
Now you say, Anthony, it didn't put in a footnote. It didn't do anything. Well, that's because we need to go back and highlight whatever text we chose because in many cases we're going to be writing our own information based on the research article that we're going to read. But I need that bibliography. I need that citation. So when I come back here and hover over the name, you'll notice on the bottom I have a couple choices. I can preview the whole document. I can insert a link to that website, or I can click on the Cite button. When I click on the Cite button, it adds another footnote. And down at the bottom, you will notice that we have now a properly formatted citation. Now, I know all the language arts people out there are going, but what kind of is, what is it, an MLA? Is it a, is it a Chicago? Is it an APA? Well, guess what? As I said earlier, it slices, dices, and more. And if you notice, you click on this little arrow up at the top here, and you go down to where it says citation type, and you can choose any of these three types of citations. So if I want to change it to a Chicago style, APA, or MLA, those are all available directly from this link. Also, when I'm searching for images from this same link, I can choose whether I want items that are free to use or modify, or items that are not filtered. So again, this little drop down arrow, we'll close that and reopen it again. I just got Raccoon International open, so let's get out of there. And now I have followed a link to a YouTube with a funny raccoon, of course. So let's go back here and get it back under control. So good old reload a page took care of that. And you notice again, that feature was available from this little drop down right here that lets you choose the citation types. Now, let's choose our little arrow here. Let's come down and just simply get a dictionary definition of raccoon. There we go. So there's our definition of raccoon. We can also change this little drop down. We could find scholarly articles on raccoons. Um, parallel mesh ad adaptive framework for hyperbolic conservation laws. Um, so we could insert that. We could read the whole PDF. We could cite it as a footnote if we wanted to. Let's use our little drop down again and let's go down to tables. Now what tables are, or tables are tabular data. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's see what kind of tables of data we get for raccoons. Well here's some raccoon subspecies and where they're from, uh, what their range is. I see we have another article here on something about the origin of the name from raccoons. We have something about raccoon dogs, and we have something else here. I have no idea what the table is about, but we have a wide variety of table results for raccoons. So again, that's the research tool. You can use it to look up items. You can use it for definitions. You can drag images directly into your document. You can, cite, you can create citations. You can create links. So it's sort of an all-purpose tool. So I'm going to go ahead and close our research tool, and we're going to move on to our next fabulous feature. And again, as I mentioned, all of these are outlined in the handout PDF, I'm sorry, uh, slideshow, which is available on the website. Again, that's tiny.cc slash spark232. And it's just a demonstration of everything I've just done. It's always nice to have screenshots in case the web doesn't cooperate. And here's simply a definition. Okay. Definitely one of the top fabulous tools. This is one of the newest tools that's available. And I, you might be saying this was available before. Well, it was available as an add-on, but now it is available in its own format. So first of all, but before I do this, I'm going to change the font size a little bit here. And I'm going to go to Tools, and I'm going to turn on something called Voice Typing. Brings up a microphone, and it says Click to Speak. Now, if this is the first time you're doing it, it's going to ask you for permission to use your microphone. But I've used it a number of times, so it's not going to. So let's click on this. Once upon a time... There were three little pigs. Let's try that one more time because I'm using two microphones here and I'm not sure which microphone it's pulling audio from. There we go. Period, new line. Once upon a time, there were three little pigs. The first pig's name was Bob. Period, new line. Now you notice what it did is it went back and corrected Bop into Bob um, so it looks at context clues 
both before and after the words you're writing. And I'm just sitting here just rambling and it's just typing on its own. And I didn't train it. I didn't do anything with it. So it's a really neat tool. I'm going to go ahead and stop it. It'll just keep writing forever. Period. New line. End of story. And we'll turn it off. So it's a great tool for students or for adults that may have some difficulty typing. Voice typing is really a great step forward. It does a pretty good job. It doesn't do everything exactly, so you do need to do some good proofing on it. We'll talk about that in a moment. But it's a great way to get your information into your document fast, and then you can go ahead and tweak it and clean it up. And it was giving me some messages here saying it was having a hard time hearing me because I was using a microphone that was not my microphone that I was using for the webinar. So I'm going to stop right here for a moment, and I'm going to show you something that will aid this process. It's sort of a tool that goes along with it very well. This is an example of a Google Chrome extension. It's called uh, Read Write for Google Docs. I'm going to click on it. It pops open here. It's a tool that has both a free and paid version. Everything I'm going to demonstrate today, though, is the free version. And again, we have a detailed thing on this under supercharging Google Docs with add-ons and extensions as one of our webinars. I'm going to click right here. I'm going to come in and change the voice setting first because I know I have it in a voice setting that I don't want. And I think I'm going to take UK female voice. And I'm going to click on the play button. And hopefully you can hear this. Uh, we're not going to be able to do that because the microphones are not going to let the sound come through because I have it muted. Let's unmute it and see if we can. Want to do that went back and corrected block in the barn so he looks at context clues both before and after the word you're writing and I'm just sitting here just rambling and it's just typing on the phone and I didn't trade so we can stop it now this is a great tool whether you've used the voice typing feature or whether you just use the regular typing feature this is a great way to proofread an article um, both myself and Eric, you'll walk down the hall and hear uh, read write for Google talking to us, um, proofing article. Because when you type something out, your brain realizes what you typed. And when you go to read it, your brain thinks that you typed the same thing. So it reads it back the same way. So again, that's read write for Google. Again, it's featured in some of our other webinars. So let's get back to our fabulous features. Let's talk about translation. Uh, translation tool allows us to translate either part of a document or a whole document. Now, when you use the translation tool, it actually creates a copy of your document. It doesn't change your original document. It creates a copy of it. And um, I don't have a document here in Spanish right now, or I could bring that up and we could try translating it. What I would do is I would just pick up one of my English documents here. And I have no idea what this is, so it's always dangerous. Oh, good. Something very interesting. We could come in here and we can go to our translate tool. And it will translate the document into one of a few different languages. Just a few. Now, unfortunately, I'm not very, I don't know all these languages. So I could do it and you wouldn't know whether it's right or not. So we're going to pick a language you probably no one out there knows right now, the poly. So uh, again, apologies to anyone who's in Nepal right now. Uh, we're going to use your language as an example. And we will see what it looks like. And there's the language. And you notice the URLs remained in our original language because they have to be saved as URLs. Now, is this perfect? No. This is not a perfect translation tool in your language arts. And so your foreign language teachers will tell you that immediately. But it's a great way for you to communicate with a parent who might have limited or no English ability. Um, it also allows me as a person who has no other foreign language ability to possibly translate things and get a good idea. So again, it's mechanical. It's not as good as human translations, but it's a great start at being able to increase the accessibility of documents to people with different languages. So let's continue down our fabulous features. And our next fabulous feature is something called add-ons. Now, add-ons create their own menu. So let's take a look at that real quick. 
Here's a menu, it's called add-ons, and if you've not added anything on before, your menu is blank. And I have a, quite a few add-ons on mine, so you'll see that I have a lot of choices of add-ons available. If I do not have an add-on, I can simply go down to Get Add-ons. I can search for something that I want. Let's say I'm looking for Paragraph. It will show me tools that are related to that. If I've installed the tool already, it'll show me as manage. If I've not installed the tool, it'll have a little button here that I can choose it. Almost all of these are free, the ones you'd be using. There are some commercial products, but they're for very specialized uses that you probably would not be using. So these are things where you can create additional features. Now, people have written these to work with, the doc, with Google Docs to give it extra abilities. Now, one of these before was something called speech recognition. And it would do the same thing as voice type. But it's really not necessary anymore in this case because voice type has now been added to the actual tool itself. So there's a couple here that we really like. Um, in Lucid Diagrams, great. You can insert a diagram uh, uh, if you want a um, chart a flow chart, a Venn diagram. These are the kind of things you can do from here. So there's a wide variety of things you can do from add-ons. And again, another whole webinar. We're not going to have time to talk about all the add-ons that are available. Some of the add-ons require two document types. Remember, I mentioned the one before to do a mail merge. You needed both a sheet and a doc. And it depends on what how the add-on is set up. In that case, you actually add the add-on for mail merging to the Google Sheets. There are add-ons available for Docs, Sheets, and Forms. There are no add-ons currently available for Slides. And that's one of the predictions we have for the coming year, that we might see that. So I have put together a list here. I'm going to tell you one to look at definitely is GMath. They might say, well, GMath, I don't do any math in my class. Well, GMath is actually much more um, full-featured than just math. So let's go to it real quick here. Just look at one thing, look at GMath. And GMath is very interesting because not only can you create mathematical ex expressions, you can create a graph. You can also create a handwritten entry. So I can simply come in here, and this is a beta tool, but it works pretty nice. I can put in my initial signature, click on the insert button, and there it is. So I can do anything I want with both math, handwriting symbols. They also have it made now when you do the math portion. It has voice typing included in that. So when we go to add-ons, GMath, we create mathematical expressions. You see we have a variety of ways we can do it. We can click on the voice typing. We can type into it. We can come down here and use the pre-built function tools down at the bottom. So again, uh, GMath. Many, many features, not just for math or science. Take a look at it. It's a great add-on. Gentleman down in Chile joined us for one of our um, Google user group meetings. We have those monthly. And again, they're available from our schedule page, which I'll go through at the end of today's session. Going back to our webinar, there are two other things that you can add to Google Docs, but they aren't really being added to Google Docs. They're extensions and apps. And they're often confused with add-ons, but extensions get installed in your browser, your Chrome browser. So they work in any program you can open in your browser. So for example, I have one installed here called Colorzilla. When I click on it, it lets me pick my mouse and hover over a color on the page and show me what color I'm on. And it gives me the hex code and I can copy that color and I can reuse that color for other things. But I can do that any any page it opens up. It's not simply limited to Google Docs. So that's an example of an extension. Uh, apps um, are special little programs. Uh, for example, there's no word, there's no desktop publishing application in the Google Suite, but there's something called Lucid Press, which is an example of an app. And there's many, many apps. And if you have a Chromebook, especially you're going to want to be familiar with apps because that's how you add new additional programs because you don't install programs on a Chromebook, but you can add apps to it. So again, not to be confused with add-ons or to be confused with uh, extensions. So here's a list of some of our favorite extensions and apps. And again, there's a more
section and you can find out about a lot of different Chrome web apps and extensions. Okay, we're all the way over to the right side of our menu and we're almost out of time, so we're going to continue here real quickly to go through it. On the right side of our menu, we have the help menu. And you say, okay, help. Yeah, it's, it's the same type of help as usual. But we also have something in here where we can show the keyboard shortcuts. And we show the keyboard shortcuts, it shows us all the different keyboard shortcuts. Now, some of them are really helpful and easy to use. Like if you want to bold something, control B, control copy, things of that nature. Sometimes you can't remember what you want. So let's say if you want to find out about pasting, I can type in the word paste, and it'll show me the keyboard shortcuts that refer to pasting. Pasting and paste, paste with formatting, uh, without formatting are available. So we have a wide variety of different keyboard shortcuts available. Okay, we have a time for a few bonus items. These are features that may be in other programs, not just Google Docs. But you may not be realized that they're available in Google Docs also. So maybe you have some great feature that you like in one of your word processing programs and you didn't know that Google Docs had it. So let's quickly go through some bonus items here. First one is our bonus item, paste plain text. So if we copy that giant purple text from that website and we want to paste it into our document, if we do Control-Shift-V as opposed to Control-V, it will paste it as plain text or if you put it in the middle of a document where there's other text, it will inherit the formatting from the surrounding text. So it'll blend right into your document and you don't need to worry about it looking different or throwing your document off. Our second bonus item is auto expand text. There are two ways to auto expand text. So if you get tired of typing your name over and over again, you can use one of the two features that are available. And the two features are found under tools. The first one is preferences. And in preferences, you can create a new preference. You can put in a word that you want to type and what you want it to be replaced with. So if I put in AA here, I can say I want it to type in Anthony A. Oscar. Now, unfortunately, this only lets you do one line. It does not let you do paragraphs or wraparounds. So when I click OK, if I come in here and type AA and press space, notice it pops into Anthony Oscar. And I actually put it in earlier, so unfortunately it didn't have the Anthony A because it grabbed the first definition that I had used. So again, you can do that from tools, preferences. The other way you can do it is from tools, personal dictionary, where you can add words into your dictionary and have them generate text automatically for you. So bonus number two. Bonus number three, we already showed. You already saw bonus number three when we double-clicked on the image and we were able to crop it and edit it. Bonus number four, if you're going through a document and you need the link for this, you know, this has a website attached to it, and I can't remember what the link is. If I click on the link feature, I can actually type in here what I want to find the link for, and it will search for me and get the link. So here's the Spark link, and I can just simply insert it, click Apply, and now it has that link. So I don't need to go back to the page and find it. I can do my little Google search right in the page to find the link. Bonus number five. You can create a table of contents from the insert menu by setting up different headers. You can create the, this table of contents. The one limitation is it is only a hyperlink table of contents. So it does no good if you print it out. It doesn't have page numbers on it. Hopefully page numbers will come around. Again, that's one of the neat things about Google Docs is there's new features all the time. Now, number six, you can type in a different language. You can change your language. I would suggest you have a keyboard that matches that language but again you just go over to file and you go to change language and there's a wide variety of languages available bonus number seven you can insert a map well how do you insert a map it's pretty neat we go back to our tool research and now we come in here and we search for an address 2100 38th street northwest and there's the address we want. And I didn't mean to do that. If I simply take this and drag it on here, it should create. Oops, I get my map. Come on, I want my map. It's not giving me my map. I'm sorry. Just believe me, I'm not going to have time to demonstrate it, but you can grab your map from here and drag it in. And I'm not sure why it didn't want to give me my map. Oh, it's like giving me my map now. 
Well, sometimes features don't show up when you want them, but believe me, just follow the instructions here and it will work for you, even though it's not working for me today. Bonus number eight is only for the geekiest among you, and that is you can extend what Google Docs can do by using something called app scripts. If you don't know what an app script is, don't worry, you don't want to use it. But if you're really geeky, there's a whole scripting language available for Google Apps that you can utilize. So that's the end of our items for today. Thank you for watching the webinar. Again, all the resources can be found at tiny.cc slash spark232. In addition, you can find all of our technology integration resources at ti.apps.spark.org. And when you go there, you will see something that looks like this. There's a whole lot of Google resources. There's my webpage, aka the Web Resource Hoarder site, which is an adventure in itself. There's a professional development schedule. There's a link to all of our recorded webinars and trainings. I'm just going to pop that open real quick. And you'll notice that we have almost 30. This will make 30, I think, today or 29. I'm not sure, but you can click on any of these and go through the same procedure. So, again, a great follow-up for today's session would be uh, collaborating and sharing, uh, Google tools for special needs, supercharging um, Docs with add-ons. So those are all things that we talked about today that you can get a lot more detail on. Let's flip back here real quick. The last thing is, the last items at the bottom here is you can subscribe to our newsletter, Sparklines, and we will send you reminders approximately once or twice a month. We don't bombard you with them, but uh, just be aware they're there. And we love to hear from our webinar viewers. We've passed the 40,000 mark. Unfortunately, we don't know where you're all from. We know you're from all around the world because we look at the quizzes and from the quizzes we get locations, but not everyone takes a quiz that views the videos. So we know we're, we've probably got people in every state and I know we got many, many countries out there that have watched the webinars, but we'd love to hear from you, not just from us. So if you have a great idea, a comment, a question, please feel free to contact myself or Eric our addresses are here in the presentation, and they're also available on the tech integration site at the top where it says contacts. By the way, there's a picture of Eric, and there's a picture of me. I'll close that quickly because I don't want you to see the picture of me too long. So, again, please feel free to contact us. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for putting up as I sped through these. I didn't like, think I was going to be able to get it done in an hour, but I think we got in just under an hour, including our eight bonuses. So, again, just like the TV commercial says, it slices, it dices, it does everything you want. And if you just pay additional shipping and handling, we'll send you two of them. So, again, thanks for watching Fabulous Features. Please tune in for future webinars. And please, we'd love to hear your feedback. Thank you very much.